Chapter Eight of The Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. The Wreck of the Half Moon. Instantly, Barbara Harding looked into the face of the mucker. She read her danger. Why the man should hate her, she could not guess. But that he did was evidenced by the malevolent expression on his surly countenance. For a moment he stood glaring at her. Then he spoke. "'I'm wise to what you and that guy was chinning about,' he growled. "'And I'm right here to tell yous that you don't want to try to put nothing over on me, see? Yous ain't a-goin' to double-cross Billy Byrne. I got a good notion to hand yous what's comin' to you. And if it hadn't been for yous, I wouldn't have been here on this godforsaken wreck. Yous is the cause of all the trouble. What yous ought to get is croaked, and then there wouldn't be nothing to bother any of us. You and your bunch of kale, they give me a swift pain.' For half a cent I'd soak you a wallop to the solar plexus that would put you to sleep for a long count. You, you, but here words failed, Billy. To his surprise the girl showed not the slightest indication of fear. Her head was high, and her level gaze never wavered from his own eyes. Presently a sneer of contempt curled her lip. You coward, she said quietly, to insult and threaten a woman. You are nothing but an insufferable bully, and a cowardly murderer. You murdered a man on a lotus whose little finger held more true manhood, bravery, and worth than the whole of your great hulking carcass. You are only fit to strike from behind, or when your victim is unsuspecting, as you did Mr. Terrier the other day. Do you think I fear a thing such as you, a beast without honor that kicks an unconscious man in the face? I know that you can kill me. I know that you are coward enough to do it because I am a defenseless woman, and though you may kill me, you never can make me show fear for you. That is what you wish to do. That is your idea of manliness. I had never imagined that such a thing as you lived in the guise of man. But I have read you, Mr. Byrne, since I have had occasion to notice you, and I know now that you are what is known in the great cities as a mucker. The term never meant much to me before, but I see now it fits your kind perfectly, for in it is all the loathing and contempt that a real man, a gentleman, must feel for such as you. As she spoke, Billy Byrne's eyes narrowed, but not with the cunning of premeditated attack. He was thinking. For the first time in his life he was thinking of how he appeared in the eyes of another. Never had any human being told Billy Byrne thus coolly and succinctly what sort of person he seemed to them. In the heat of anger, men of his own stamp had applied vile epithets to him, describing him luridly as such that by the simplest laws of nature he could not possibly be. But this girl had spoken coolly, and her descriptions had been explicit backed by illustrations. She had given real reasons for her contempt, and somehow it made that contempt seem very tangible. One who had known Billy would have expected him to fly into a rage and attack the girl brutally after her scathing diatribe. Billy did nothing of the sort. Barbara Harding's words seemed to have taken all the fight out of him. He stood looking at her for a moment. It was one of the strange contradictions of Billy Byrne's personality that he could hold his eyes quite steady and level, meeting the gaze of another unwaveringly, and in that moment something happened to Billy Byrne's perceptive faculties. It was as though scales which had dimmed his mental vision had partially dropped away, for suddenly he saw what he had not seen before. A very beautiful girl, brave and unflinching before the brutal menace of his attitude, and though the mucker thought that he still hated her, the realization came to him that he must not raise a hand against her, that for the life of him he could not, nor ever again against any other woman. Why this change, Billy did not know. He simply knew that it was so, and with an ugly grunt he turned his back upon her and walked away. A slight breeze had risen from the southwest since Terrier had left Barbara Harding, and now all hands were busily engaged in completing the jury-rigging that the half-moon might take advantage of the wind and make the shore that rose abruptly from the bosom of the ocean but a league away. Before the work was completed the wind increased rapidly, so that when the tiny bit of canvas was hoisted into position it bellied bravely and the half-moon moved heavily forward toward the land. "'We gotta make a mighty quick run of it,' said Skipper Sims to Ward, "'but we'll go to pieces on them rocks before we ever find a landing.' "'That we will if this wind rises much more,' replied Ward. "'And so far as I can see, there ain't no more chance to make a landing there than there would be on the side of a house.' And indeed, as the half-moon neared the towering cliffs, it seemed utterly hopeless that aught else than a fly could find a foothold upon that sheer and rocky face that rose abruptly from the ocean's surface. Some two hundred yards from the shore it became evident that there was no landing to be made directly before them, and so the course of the ship was altered to carry them along parallel to the shore in an effort to locate a cove 
or beach where a landing might safely be effected the wind increasing steadily was now whipping the sea into angry breakers that dashed resoundingly against the rocky barrier of the island to drift within reach of those frightful destroyers would mean the instant annihilation of the half moon and all her company yet this was precisely what the almost unmanageable hulk was doing at the wheel under the profane direction of skipper simms while ward and terrier with a handful of men altered the meager sail from time to time in an effort to keep the ship off the rocks for a few moments longer the half moon was almost upon the cliff's base when a narrow opening showed some hundred fathoms before her nose an opening through which the sea ran in long surging sweeps rolling back upon itself in angry breakers that filled the aperture with swirling water and high-flung spume to have attempted to drive the ship into such a place would have been the height of madness under ordinary circumstances no man knew what lay beyond nor whether the opening carried sufficient water to float the half moon though the long powerful sweep of the sea as it entered the opening denoted considerable depth skipper simms seeing the grim rocks rising close beside the vessel realized that naught could keep her from them now he saw death peering close to his face he felt the icy breath of the grim reaper on his brow a coward at heart he lost every vestige of his nerve in that crucial moment of his life leaping from the wheelhouse to the deck he ran backwards and forwards shrieking at the top of his lungs begging and entreating some one to save him and offering fabulous rewards to the man who carried him safely to the shore the sight of their captain in a blue funk had its effect upon the majority of the crew so that in a moment a pack of screaming terror-ridden men had supplanted the bravos and bullies of the half moon from the cabin companionway barbara harding looked upon the disgusting scene her lip curled in scorn at the sight of those men weeping and moaning in their fright she saw ward busy about one of the hatches it was evident that he intended making a futile attempt to utilize it as a means of escape after the half moon struck for he was attaching ropes to it and dragging it towards the port side of the ship away from the shore larry divine crouched beside the cabin and wept when simms gave up on the ship barbara harding saw that the wheelmen there had been two of them desert their post and almost instantly the nose of the half moon turned toward the rocks but scarcely had the men reached the deck the terrier leapt to their place at the wheel unassisted he could do little with the heavy helm barbara saw that he alone of all the officers and men of the brigantine was making an attempt to save the vessel however futile the effort might be it at least bespoke the coolness and courage of the man with the sight of him there wrestling with death in a hopeless struggle a little wave of pride surged through the girl here indeed was a man and he loved her that she knew whether or no she returned his love her place was beside him now to give what encouragement and physical aid lay in her power quickly she ran to the wheelhouse terrier saw her and smiled there's no hope i'm afraid he said but by george i intend to go down fighting and not like those miserable yellow curs barbara did not reply but she grasped the spokes of the heavy wheel and tugged as he tugged terrier made no effort to dissuade her from the strenuous labor every ounce of weight would help so much and the man had a wild mad idea that he was attempting to put into effect what do you hope to do asked the girl make that opening in the cliffs terrier nodded do you think me crazy he asked it is such a chance as only a brave man would dare to take she replied so you think that we can get her to take it i doubt it he answered with another man at the wheel we might though below them the crew of the half moon ran hither and thither along the deck on the side away from the breakers they fought with one another for useless bits of planking and cordage the giant figure of the black cook blanco rose above the others in his hand was a huge butcher knife when he saw a piece of wood he coveted in the hands of another he rushed upon his helpless victim with wild bestial howls menacing him with his gleaming weapon thus he was rapidly accumulating the material for a life raft but there was a single figure upon the deck that did not seem mad with terror a huge fellow he was who stood leaning against the capstan watching the wild antics of his fellows with a certain wondering expression of incredulity the while a contemptuous smile curled his lips as barbara harding chanced to look in his direction he also chanced to turn his eyes toward the wheelhouse it was the mucker the girl was surprised that he the greatest coward of them all should be showing no signs of cowardice now probably he was paralyzed with fright the moment that the man saw the two who were in the wheelhouse and the work that they were doing he sprang quickly towards them at his approach the girl shrank closer to terrier what new outrage did the fellow contemplate now he was beside her the habitual dark scowl blackening his expression he laid a heavy hand on barbara hardy's arm come out of that he bellowed that's no kind of job for a broiler 
and before either she or Terrier could guess his intention, the mucker had pushed Barbara aside and taken her place at the wheel. "'Good for you, Byrne,' cried Terrier. "'I needed you badly.' "'Why didn't you say so, then?' growled the man. With the aid of Byrne's Herculean muscles and great weight, the bow of the half-moon commenced to come slowly around, so that presently she almost paralleled the cliffs again. But now she was much closer in than when Skipper Sims had deserted her to her fate, so close that Terrier had little hope of being able to carry out his plan of taking her opposite the opening, and then turning and running her before the wind straight into the swirling waters of the inlet. Now they were almost opposite the aperture, and between the giant cliffs that rose on either side of the narrow entrance, a sight was revealed that filled their hearts with renewed hope and rejoicing, for a tiny cove was seen to lie beyond the fissure, a cove with a long, wide, sandy beach up which the waves, broken at the entrance to the little haven, rolled with much diminished violence. "'Can you hold her for a second, Byrne?' asked Terrier. "'We must make the turn in another moment, and I've got to let out the sail. The instant that you see me cut her loose, put your helm hard to the starboard. She'll come around easily enough, I imagine, and then hold her nose straight for that opening. It's one chance in a thousand, but it's the only one. Are you game? You know it, Cull. Go to it, was Billy Byrne's laconic rejoinder. As Terrier left the wheel, Barbara Harding stepped to the mucker's side. Let me help you, she said. We need every hand that we can get for the next few moments. Beat it, growled the man. I don't want no skirts in my way. With a flush, the girl drew back and then turning, watched Terrier, where he stood, ready to cut loose the sail at the proper instant. The vessel was now opposite the cleft in the cliffs. Terrier had lashed a new sheet in position. Now he cut the old one. The sail swung around until caught in position by the stout line. The mucker threw the helm hard to starboard. The nose of the brigantine swung quickly toward the rocks. The sail filled, and an instant later the ship was dashing to what seemed like her inevitable doom. Skipper Sims, seeing what Terrier had done after it was too late to prevent it, dashed madly across the deck toward his Juno. "'You fool!' he shrieked. "'You fool! What are you doing? Driving us straight for the rocks? Murdering the whole lot of us?' And with that he sprung upon the Frenchman with a maniacal fury, bearing him to the deck beneath him. Barbara Harding saw the attack of the feared, demented man, but she was powerless to prevent it. The mucker saw it, too, and grinned. He hoped that it would be a good fight. There was nothing that he enjoyed more. He was sorry that he could not take a hand in it, but the wheel demanded all his attention now so that he was even forced to take his eyes from the combatants that he might rivet them upon the narrow entrance to the cove toward which the half-moon was now plowing her way at constantly increasing speed. The other members of the ship's company, all unmindful of the battle that at another time would have commanded their undivided attention, stood with eyes glued upon the wild channel toward which the brigantine's nose was pointed. They saw now what Skipper Sims had failed to see, the little cove beyond, and the chance for safety that the bold stroke offered if it proved successful. With steady muscles and giant sinews, the mucker stood by the wheel, nursing the erratic wreck as no one might have supposed it was in him to do. Behind him, Barbara Harding watched first Terrier and Sims, and then Burn and the swelling waters toward which he was heading the ship. Even the strain of the moment did not prevent her from wondering at the strange contradictions of the burly young ruffian, who could at one moment show such traits of cowardliness, and the next rise so coolly to the highest pinnacles of courage. As she watched him occasionally, now she noted for the first time the leonine contour of his head, and she was surprised to note that his features were regular and fine, and then she recalled Billy Mallory and the cowardly kick that she had seen him deliver to the face of the unconscious Terrier. With a shudder of disgust, she turned away from the man at the wheel. Terrier by this time had managed to get on top of Skipper Sims, but that worthy still clung to him with the desperation of a drowning man. The half-moon was rising on a great wave that would bear her into the maelstrom of the cove's entrance. The wind had increased to the proportion of a gale, so that the brigantine was fairly racing either to her doom or her salvation. Who could tell which? Halfway through the entrance the wave dropped the ship, and with a mighty crash that threw Barbara Harding to her feet, the vessel struck full of the chips upon a sunken reef. Like a thing of glass she broke in two with the terrific impact, and in another instant the waters about her were filled with screaming men. Barbara Harding felt herself hurtled from the deck as though shot from a catapult. The swirling waters engulfed her. She knew that her end had come. Only the most powerful of swimmers might hope to win through the lashing hell of waters to the beach beyond. For a girl to do it was too helpless even to contemplate, but she recalled Terrier's words of no short time ago. There's no hope, I'm afraid, but by George I intend to go down fighting. And with the recollection came a like resolve on her part, to go down fighting, and so she struck out against the powerful waters that swirled her hither and thither, now perilously close to the rocky sides of the entrance, 
and now into the mad chaos of the channel's center. Would to heaven that Terrier were near her, she thought. If any could save her, it would be he. Since she had come to believe in the man's friendship and sincerity, Barbara Harding had felt renewed hope of eventual salvation, and with the hope had come a desire to live, which had almost been lacking for the greater part of her detention upon the half-moon. Bravely she battled now against the awful odds of the mighty Pacific, but soon she felt her strength waning. More and more ineffectually became her puny efforts, and at last she ceased almost entirely the futile struggle. And then she felt a strong hand grasp her arm, and with a sudden surge she was swung over a broad shoulder. Quickly she grasped the rough shirt that covered the back of her would-be rescuer, and then commenced a battle with the waves that for many minutes, that seemed hours to the frightened girl, hung in the balance. But at last the swimmer beneath her forged steadily and persistently toward the sandy beach to found her out at last with an unconscious burden in his mighty arms. As the man staggered up out of reach of the water, Barbara Harding opened her eyes to look in astonishment into the face of the mucker. End of chapter 8「Nine of the Mucker » by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Joe DeNoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Oda Yorimoto Only four men of the Half Moon's crew were lost in the wreck of the vessel. All had been crowded in the bow when the ship broke in two, and being far flung by the forward part of the brigandine as it lunged toward the cove on the way following the one which had dropped the craft upon the reef, with the exception of the four who had perished beneath the wreckage, they had been able to swim safely to the beach. Larry Devine, who had sat weeping upon the deck of the doomed ship during the time that hope had been at its lowest, had recovered his ports. Skipper Sims, subdued for the moment, soon commenced to regain his bluster. He took Terrier to task for the loss of the half-moon. "'That ever we make a civilized port,' he shouted, "'I'll prefer charges again you, you swab, you, a losin' o' the finest bark as ever weathered a storm. If it hadn't a been for you a-mutinin' again me, I'd have brought her through safely, and never lost a bloomin' soul. Stow it, admonished Terrier at last. Your foolish bluster can't hide the bald fact that you deserted your post in time of danger. We're ashore now, remember, and there is no more ship for you to command. So were I you, I'd be mighty careful how I talk to my betters. What's that? screamed the skipper. My betters? You frog-eatin' greaser, you. I'll teach you. Here, some of you, clap the swab in irons. I'll learn him that I'm still captain on this here bunch. Terrier laughed in the man's face, but Ward and a couple hands who had been shown favoritism by the skipper and first mate closed menacingly toward the second officer. The Frenchman took in the situation at a glance. They were ashore now, where they didn't think that they needed him further, and the process of elimination had commenced. Well, it might as well come to a showdown now as later. Just a moment, said Terrier, raising his hand. You're not going to take me alive, and I have no idea that you want to anyhow. And if you start anything in the killing line, some of you are going to Davy Jones' locker along with me. The best thing for all concerned is to divide up this party now, once and for all. As he finished speaking, he turned towards Billy Byrne. Are you and the others with me or against me? he asked. I'm again Sims, replied the mucker noncommittally. Bony Sawyer, Red Sanders, Blanco, Wisson, and two others drew in behind Billy Byrne. We all's with Billy, announced Blanco. Divine and Barbara Harding stood a little apart. Both were alarmed at this sudden hostile turn of events had taken. Sims, Ward, and Terrier were the only members of the party armed. Each wore a revolver strapped about his hips. All were still dripping from their recent plunge in the ocean. Five men stood behind Skipper Sims and Ward, but there were two revolvers upon that side of the argument. Suddenly Ward turned toward Divine. "'Are you armed, Mr. Divine?' he asked. Divine nodded affirmatively. "'Then you'd better come over with us. It looks like we might need your help to put down this mutiny,' said Ward. Divine hesitated. He did not know which side was more likely to be victorious, and he wanted to be sure to be on the winning side. Suddenly an inspiration came to him. "'This is purely a matter to be settled by the ship's officers,' he said. "'I am only a prisoner. Call me a passenger, if you like. I have no interest whatever in the matter, and shall not take sides.' "'Yes, you will,' said Mr. Ward in a low but menacing tone. "'You're in too deep to try to ditch us now. "'If you don't stand by us, we'll treat you as one of the mutineers when we're done with them, "'and you can come pretty near guessing what they'll get.' "'Divine was about to reply, and the nature of his answer was suggested "'by the fact that he had already taken a few steps in the direction of Sim's fashion "'when he was stopped by a low voice of a girl behind him. "'Larry,' she said, 
I know all, your entire connection with this plot. If you have a spark of honor or manhood left, you will do what little you can to retrieve the terrible wrong you have done me and my father. You can never marry me. I give you my word of honor that I shall take my own life if that is the only way to thwart your plans in that direction. And so as the fortune can never be yours, it seems to me that the next best thing would be to try and save me from the terrible predicament in which your cupidity had placed me. You can make the start now, Larry, by walking over and placing yourself at Mr. Terrier's disposal. He has promised to help and protect me. A deep flush mounted to the man's neck and face. He did not turn about to face the girl he had so grievously wronged. For the life of him he could not have met her eyes. Slowly he turned, and with gaze bent upon the ground, walked quickly towards Terrier. Ward was quick to recognize the turn of events had taken, and to see that it gave Terrier the balance of power, with two guns and nine men in his party, against their two guns and seven men. It was also evident to him that to the other party the girl would naturally gravitate since Divine, an old acquaintance, had cast his lot with it nor had the growing intimacy between Miss Harding and Terrier been lost upon him. Ward knew that Sims was an arrant coward, nor was he himself overly keen for an upstanding man-to-man -man encounter, such as must quickly follow any attempt upon his part to uphold the authority of Sims, or their claim upon the custody of the girl. Intrigue and trickery were more to Ward's liking, and so he was quick to alter his plan of campaign the instant that it became evident that Divine had elected to join forces with the opposing faction. I reckon, he said, directing his remarks towards no one in particular, that we've all been rather hasty in this matter, being head up, as it were, with the strain of what we've been going through. And so it seems to me, taking into consideration that Mr. Terrier really done his best to save the ship, and that as a matter of fact we was all mighty lucky to come out of it alive, that we'd better let bygones be bygones, for the time being at least, and all of us pitch in to save what we can from the wreckage, hunt water, rig up a camp, and get things sort of ship-shape here instead of squabbling amongst ourselves. Suit yourself, said Terrier, it's all the same to us, and his use of the objective pronoun seemed definitely to establish the existence of his faction as a separate and distinct party. Sims, from years of experience with his astute mate, was wont to acquiesce in anything that Ward proposed, though he had not the brains always to appreciate the purposes that prompted Ward's suggestions. Now, therefore, he nodded his approval of Squint Eye's proposal, feeling that whatever was in Ward's mind would be more likely to work out to Skipper Sims' interests than some unadvised act of Skipper Sims himself. Supposing, continued Ward, that we let two of your men and two of ourn under Mr. Devine shin up them cliffs back of the cove and search for water and a site for camp, the rest of us will have our hands full with the salvage. Good, agreed Terrier. Miller, you, and Swenson will accompany Mr. Devine. Ward detailed two of his men, and the party of five began a difficult ascent of the cliffs, while far above them the little brown man with beady black eyes set in narrow freshly slits watched them from behind a clump of bushes. Strange medieval armor and two wicked-looking swords gave him a most warlike appearance. His temples were shaved, and a broad strip on the top of his head to just beyond the crown. His remaining hair was drawn into an unbraided queue, tied tightly at the back, and the queue then brought forward to the top of the forehead. His helmet lay in the grass at his feet. At the nearer approach of the party to the cliff top, the watcher turned and melted into the forest at his back. He was Oda Yorimoto, descendant of a powerful daimyo of the Ashikaga dynasty of shoguns who had fled Japan with his faithful samurai nearly three hundred and fifty years before upon the overthrow of the Ashikaga dynasty. Upon this unfrequented and distant Japanese isle, the exiles have retained all of their medieval military savagery to which had been added the aboriginal ferocity of the head-hunting natives they had found there, and with whom they had intermarried. The little colony, far from making any advances in arts or letters, had, on the contrary, relapsed into primeval ignorance as deep as that of the natives with which they had cast their lot. Only in their arms and armor, their military training and discipline, do they show any of the influence of their civilized progenitors. They were cruel, crafty, resourceful wild men trapped in the habiliments of a dead past, and armed with the keen weapons of their forebears. They had not even the crude religion of the Malaysians they had absorbed unless a highly exaggerated propensity for head-hunting might be defined by the name of religion. To the tender mercies of such as these were the castaways of the half-moon likely to be consigned, for what might sixteen men with but four revolvers among them accomplished against nearly a thousand savage samurai? Terrier, Ward, Sims, and the remaining sailors at the beach busied themselves with the task of retrieving such of the wreckage and the salvage of the half-moon as the waves had deposited in the shallows of the beach. There were casks of fresh water, kegs of biscuit, 
clothing, tinned meats, and a similar heterogeneous mass of flotsam. This arduous labor consumed the best part of the afternoon, and it was not until they had been completed that Divine and his party returned to the beach. They reported that they had discovered a spring of fresh water some three miles east of the cove and about a half mile inland, but it was decided that no attempt be made to transport the salvage of the party to the new campsite until the following morning. Terrier and Divine erected a rude shelter for Barbara Harding, close under the foot of the cliff, and far from the water as possible, while above them Oda Yorimoto watched their proceedings with beady, glittering eyes. This time a half-dozen of his fierce samurai crouched at his side. Besides their two swords, these latter bore the primitive spears of their mother's savage tribe. Oda Yorimoto watched the white men upon the beach. Also he watched the white girl, even more, possibly, than he watched the men. He saw the shelter that was being built, and when it was complete he saw the girl enter it, and he knew that it was for her alone. Oda Yorimoto sucked in his lips, and his eyes narrowed even more than nature had intended that they should. A fire burned before the rude domicile that Barbara Harding was to occupy, and another, larger fire roared a hundred yards to the west, where the men were congregated about Blondo, who was attempting to evolve a meal from the miscellany of his larder that had been cast up by the sea. There seemed now but little to indicate that the party was divided into two bitter factions, but when the meal was over, Terrier called his men to a point midway between Barbara's shelter and the main campfire. Here he directed them to dispose themselves for the night as best they could, building a fire of their own if they chose, for with the coming of darkness the chill of the tropical night would render a fire more than acceptable. All were thoroughly tired and exhausted, so that darkness had scarcely fallen ere the entire camp seemed wrapped in slumber. And still, Oda Yorimoto sat with his samurai upon the cliff's summit, beady eyes fixed upon his intended prey. For an hour he sat thus in silence, until, assured that they were all asleep before him, he arose, and with a few whispered instructions, commenced the descent of the cliff toward the cove below. Scarce had he started, however, with his men stringing in single file behind him, that he came to a sudden halt. From below him in the camp that lay between the girl's shelter and the westerly camp, a figure had arisen stealthily from among the fellows. It was Terrier. Cautiously he moved to a sleeper nearby, whom he shook gently until he had awakened him. Hush, Burn, cautioned the Frenchman. It is I, Terrier. Help me awaken the others. See that there is no noise. What's doing? queried the mucker. We are going to break camp and occupy a new location before that bunch of pirates can beat us to it, whispered Terrier in reply. And, he added, we're going to take the salvage and the girl with us. The mucker grinned. Gee, he said, won't they be a sore bunch in the morning? The work of awakening the balance of the party required but a few minutes, and when the plan was explained to them, all seemed delighted with the prospect of discomforting Skipper Sims and Squint Eye. It was decided that only the eatables be carried away on the first trip, and that if a second trip was possible before dawn, the clothing, canvas, and cordage that had been taken from the water might then be purloined. Miller and Swenson were detailed to bring up the rear with Miss Harding, assisting her up the steep side of the cliff. Divine was to act as a guide to the new camp lending a hand whenever necessary in the scaling of the heights where the loop. Cautiously, the party, with the exception of Divine, Miller, and Swenson, crept toward the little pile of supplies that were heaped fifty or sixty feet from the sleeping members of Sims' faction. The three left behind walked in silence to Barbara Harding's shelter. Here, Divine scratched at the piece of sailcloth which served as a door until he had succeeded in awakening the sleeper within, and from above Oda Yorimoto watched the activity in the little cove with intent and unwavering eyes. The girl, roused from a fitful slumber, came to the doorway of her primitive abode, alarmed by this nocturnal summons. "'It is I, Larry,' whispered the man. "'Are you dressed?' "'Yes,' replied the girl, stepping out in the moonlight. "'What do you want? What has happened?' "'We're going to take you away from Sims, Terrier and I,' replied the man, "'and establish a safe camp of our own where they cannot molest you. Terrier and the others have gone for the supplies now, and as soon as they return we shall commence the ascent of the cliffs.' If you have any further preparations to make, Barbara, please make haste, and we must get away from here as quickly as possible. Should any of Sim's people awaken, there is sure to be a fight. The girl turned back into the shelter to gather together a handful of wraps that had been saved from the wreck. Down by the salvage, Terrier, Byrne, Bony Sawyer, Red Sanders, Blanco, and Wisson were selecting the goods they wished to carry with them. It was found that two trips would be necessary to carry off the bulk of the rations. So Terrier sent the mucker to summon Miller and Swenson. We'll carry all that eight of us can to the top of the cliffs, he said. Hide it there, and then come back for the balance. We may be able to get it later if we are unable to make two trips in the camp tonight. 
while they were waiting for byrne to return with the two recruits one of the sleepers in sims camp stirred instantly the five marauders dropped stealthily to the ground behind the boxes and casks only terrier kept his eye above the level of the top of his shelter that he might watch the movement of the enemy the figure sat up and looked about it was ward slowly he arose and approached the pile of salvage terrier drew his revolver holding it in readiness for an emergency should the first mate look in the direction of barbara harding's shelter he must certainly see the four figures waiting there in the moonlight terrier turned his own head in the direction of the shelter that he might see how plainly the men there were visible to his delight he saw that no one was in sight either they had seen ward or for the sake of greater safety from detection had moved to the opposite side of the shelter ward was quite close to the boxes upon the other side of which crouched the night raiders terrier's finger found the trigger of his revolver he was convinced that the mate had been disturbed by the movement in camp and was investigating the frenchman knew that the search would not end upon the opposite side of the salvage and in a moment ward would be upon them he was sorry not for ward but because he had planned to carry the work out quietly and he hated to have to mess things up with the killing especially on barbara's account ward stopped at one of the water casks he tipped it up filling a tin cup with water took a long drink set the cup back on top of the cask and turning retraced his steps to the blanket terrier could have hugged himself the man had suspected nothing he merely had been thirsty and had come over for a drink in another moment he would be fast asleep once more sure enough before byrne returned with miller and swenson terrier could bear the snores of the first mate on the first trip to the cliff top eight men carried heavy burdens divine alone remaining to guard barbara harding the second trip was made with equal dispatch and safety no sound or movement came from the camp of the enemy other than that of sleeping men on the second trip divine and terrier each carried a burden up the cliffs miller and swenson following with barbara harding and as they came oda yorimoto and his samurai slunk back into the shadows that their crate might pass unobserving terrier had the bulk of the loot hidden in a rocky crevice just beyond the cliff's summit brush torn from the mass of luxuriant tropical vegetation that covered the ground was strewn over the cache all had been accomplished in safety and without detection the camp beneath them still lay wrapped in silence the march toward the new camp under the guidance of divine was immediately undertaken on the return trip after the search for water divine had discovered a well-marked trail along the edge of the cliffs to a point opposite the spring and another leading from the main trail directly to the water in his ignorance he had thought these the runways of animals whereas they were age-old highways of the headhunters now they presented a comparatively quick and easy approach to the destination of the mutineers but so narrow a one as to convince terrier that it was not feasible for him to move back and forth along the flank of his column he tried it once but it so greatly inconvenienced and retarded the heavily laden men that he abandoned the effort remaining near the center of the cavalcade until the new camp was reached here he found a fair-sized space about a clear and plentiful spring of cold water only a few low bushes dotted the grassy clearing which was almost completely surrounded by dense and impenetrable jungle the men had deposited their burdens and still terrier stood waiting for the balance of his party miller and swenson with barbara harding but they did not come and when in alarm the entire party started back in search of them they retraced their steps to the very brink of the declivity leading to the cove before they can believe the testimony of their perceptions barbara harding and the two sailors had disappeared End of chapter nine Chapter ten of The Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Barbara captured by headhunters. When Barbara Harding, with Miller before and Swenson behind her, had taken up the march behind the loot laden party, seven dusky, noiseless shadows had emerged from the forest to follow close behind. For half a mile the party moved along the narrow trail unmolested terrier had come back to exchange a half dozen words with the girl and had again moved forward toward the head of the column miller was not more than twenty-five feet behind the first man ahead of him and miss harding and swenson followed at intervals of but three or four yards suddenly without warning swenson and miller fell pierced with savage spears and at the same instant sinewy fingers gripped barbara harding and a silencing hand was clapped over her mouth there had been no sound above the muffled tread of the seamen it had all been accomplished so quickly and so easily that the girl did not comprehend what had befallen her for several minutes in the darkness of the forest she could not clearly distinguish the forms or features of her abductors 
though she reasoned as was only natural that skipper simms's party had become aware of the plot against them and had taken this means of thwarting a part of it but when her captors turned directly into the mazes of the jungle away from the coast she began first to wonder and then to doubt so that presently when a small clearing let the moonlight fall upon them she was not surprised to discover that none of the members of the half moon's company was among her guard barbara harding had not circled the globe half a dozen times for nothing there were few races or nations with whose history past and present she was not familiar and as the sight that greeted her eyes was well suited to fill her with astonishment for she found herself in the hands of what appeared to be a party of japanese warriors of the fifteenth or sixteenth century she recognized the medieval arms and armor the ancient helmets the hairdressing of the two sordid men of old japan at the belts of two of her captors dangled grisly trophies of the hunt in the moonlight she saw that they were the heads of miller and swenson the girl was horrified she had thought her lot before as bad as it could be but to be in the clutches of these strange fierce warriors of a long dead age was unthinkably worse that she could ever have wished to be back upon the half moon would have seemed a few days since incredible yet that was precisely what she longed for now on through the night marched the little brown men grim and silent until at last they came to a small village in a valley away from the coast a valley that lay nestled high among the lofty mountains here were cave-like dwellings burrowed half underground the upper walls and thatched roofs were scarcely four feet above the level granaries on stilts were dotted here and there among the dwellings into one of the filthy dens barbara harding was dragged she found a single room in which several native and half-caste women were sleeping about them stretched and curled and perched a motley throng of dirty yellow children dogs pigs and chickens it was the palace of daimyo oda yuramoto lord of yoka as his ancestors had christened their new island home once within the war and the two samurai who had guarded barbara upon the march turned and withdrew she was alone with oda yuramoto and his family from the center of the room depended a swinging shelf upon which a great pile of grinning skulls rested at the back of the room was a door which barbara had not at first noticed evidently there was another apartment to the dwelling the girl was given little opportunity to examine her new prison for scarce had the guards withdrawn than oda yuramoto approached and grasped her by the arm come he said in japanese that was sufficiently similar to modern nippon to be easily understood by barbara harding with the word he drew her toward a sleeping mat on a raised platform at one side of the room one of the women awoke at the sound of the man's voice she looked up at barbara in sullen hatred otherwise she gave no indication that she saw anything unusual transpiring it was as though an exquisite american belle were a daily visitor at the oda yuramoto home what do you want of me cried the frightened girl in japanese oda yuramoto looked at her in astonishment where had this white girl learned to speak his tongue i am the daimyo oda yuramoto he said these are my wives now you are one of them come not yet not here cried the girl clutching at the straw wait give me time to think if you do not harm me my father will reward you fabulously ten thousand koku he would gladly give to have me return to him safely oda yuramoto but shook his head twenty thousand koku cried the girl still the daimyo shook his head negatively a hundred thousand name your own price if you will but not harm me silence growled the man what are even a million koku to me who only know the word from the legends of my ancestors we have no need for koku here and had we my hills are full of the yellow metal which measures its value no you are my woman come not here not here pleaded the girl there's another room away from all these women and she turned her eyes toward the door at the opposite side of the chamber oda yuramoto shrugged his shoulders that would be easier than a fight he argued and so he led the girl toward the doorway that she had indicated within the room all was dark but the daimyo moved as one accustomed to the place and as he moved through the blackness the girl at his side felt with stealthy fingers at the man's belt at last oda yuramoto reached the far side of the long chamber here he said and took her by the shoulders here answered the girl in a low tense of voice and at the instant that she spoke oda yuramoto lord of yoka and before he guessed what was to happen his own short sword had pierced his breast a single shriek broke from the lips of the daimyo but it was so high and shrill and like the shriek of a woman in mortal terror that the woman in the next room who heard it but smiled a crooked wicked smile of hate and turned once more upon her pallet to sleep again and again barbara plunged the sword of the brown man into the still heart until she knew peradventure of a doubt that her enemy was forevermore powerless to injure her 
Then she sank, exhausted and trembling, upon the dirt floor beside the corpse. When Terrier came to the realization that Barbara Harding was gone, he jumped to the natural conclusion that Ward and Sims had discovered the ruse that he had worked upon them just in time to permit them to intercept Miller and Swenson with the girl and carry her back to the main camp. The others were prone to agree with him, though the mucker grumbled with, It listened fishy. However, all hands were turned cautiously down the face of the cliff, expecting momentarily to be attacked by the guards which they felt sure Ward would post in expectation of a return of the mutineers the moment they discovered the girl had been taken from them. But to the surprise of all, they reached the cove without molestation, and when they had crept cautiously to the vicinity of the sleepers, they discovered that they were all there, in peaceful slumber, just as they had left them a few hours before. Silently, the party retraced its steps up the cliffs. Terrier and Billy Byrne brought up the rear. "'What do you make of it anyway, Byrne? asked the Frenchman. "'If you want to get a straight cull,' replied the mucker, "'I think you know a whole lot more about it than you'd like the rest of us to think.' "'What do you mean, Burr?' cried Terrier. "'Out with it now.' "'Sure, I'll out with it. You didn't think I was bashful, did you? "'What for did you tell them two pikers, Miller and Swenson, to guard the skirt for if it wasn't for some special frame-up of your own? "'They'd never been in our gang, and that's just what you wanted them for. "'It was easy to tip them off and hike them, would you, Squib?' and the first chance you get you'd hike after them while we hold the bag taught you double cross us easy didn't you you cheapskate burn said terrier and it was easy to see that only through the strength of his willpower did he keep his temper you may have cause to suspect the motives of everyone connected with this outfit i can't say that i blame you but i want you to remember what i say to you now there was a time when i fully intended to double cross you as you say that was before you saved my life since then I have been on the square with you, not only in deed, but in thought as well. I give you the word of a man whose word once meant something. I am playing square with you now, except in one thing, and I should tell you what that is at once. I do not know where Miss Harding is, or what has happened to her, and Miller, and Swenson. That is God's truth. Now for the one thing that I just mentioned. Recently I changed my intentions relative to Miss Harding. I was after the money the same as the rest. That I am free to admit, but now I don't give a rap for it and I had intended taking advantage of the first opportunity to return Miss Harding to civilization, unharmed and without the payment of a penny to anyone. The reason for my change of heart is my own affair. In all probability you wouldn't believe the sincerity or honesty of my motives should I disclose them. I am only telling you these things because you have accused me of double dealing, and I do not want the man who saved my life at the risk of his own to have the slightest grounds to doubt my honesty with him. I have been a fairly bad egg at Byrne for a great many years but by george i'm not entirely rotted out byrne was silent for a few moments he too had recently come to the conclusion that possibly he was not entirely rotten either and had in a vague and half-formed sort of way wished for the opportunity to demonstrate the fact so he was willing to concede to another that which he craved for himself you listen all right cole he said at last and i'm willing to take ye at your own say so until i learn different thanks said terrier tersely now we can work together in the search for miss harding but where in the name of all that's holy are we to start why where we seen her last of course replied the mucker right here on top of these bluffs then we can't do anything until daylight said the frenchman not a ting and at daylight we'll most likely have a scrap on our hands from below and the mucker jerked his thumb in the direction of the cove i think said terrier that we had better spend an hour arming ourselves with sticks and stones we've a mighty good position up here one that we can defend splendidly from an assault from below and if we are prepared for them, we can stave them off a while if we need the time to search about up here for clues to Miss Harding's whereabouts. And so the party set to work to cut stout bludgeons from the trees about them, and pile loose fragments of rock in handy places near the cliff top. Terrier even went so far as to throw up a low breastwork across the top of the trail up which the enemy must climb to reach the summit of the cliff. When they had completed their preparations, three men could have held the place against ten times their number. Then they lay down to sleep leaving blanco and divine on guard for it had been decided that these two with bony sawyer should be left behind on the morrow to hold the cliff top while the others were searching for clues about the whereabouts of barbara harding they were to relieve each other at guard duty during the balance of the night scarce had the first suggestion of dawn lightened the eastern sky than divine who was again on guard awakened terrier in a moment the others were aroused and a hasty raid on the cached provisions made the lack of water was keenly felt by all but it was too far to the spring to chance taking the time necessary to fetch the much craved fluid and those who were to forge into the jungle in search of barbara harding hoped to find water further inland 
while it was decided to dispatch bony sawyer to the spring for water for those who were to remain on guard at the cliff top a hurried breakfast was made on water-soaked ship biscuits Terrier and his searching party stuffed their pockets full of them and a moment later the search was on first the men traversed the trail toward the spring looking for indication of the spot where barbara harding had ceased to follow them the girl had worn heelless buckskin shoes at the time she was taken from the lotus and these left little or no spore in the well-trampled earth of the narrow path but a careful and minute examination on the part of terrier finally resulted in the detection of a single small footprint a hundred yards from the point they had struck their trail after ascending the cliffs this far at least she had been with them the men now spread out upon either side of the track terrier and red sanders upon one side Byrne and wisson upon the other occasionally terrier would return to the trail to search for further indications of the spoor they sought the party had proceeded in that fashion for nearly half a mile when suddenly they were attracted by a low exclamation from the mucker here he called here's miller and the swede and they sure have mussed em up terrible the others hastened in the direction of his voice to come to a horrifying halt at the sight of the headless trunks of the two sailors mon dieu explained the frenchman reverting to his mother tongue as he never did except under the stress of great excitement who done it queried red saunders looking suspiciously at the mucker head hunters said terrier god what an awful fate for that poor girl billy byrne went white you don't mean that they lopped off her block he whispered in an awed voice something strange rose in the mucker's breast at the thought he had just voiced he did not attempt to analyze the sensation but it was far from joy at the suggestion that the woman he so hated had met a horrible and disgusting death at the hands of savages i'm afraid not burn said terrier in a voice that none there would have recognized as that of the harsh and masterful second officer of the half moon you're afraid not echoed burn in amazement for her sake i hope they did said terrier for such as she would have been a far less horrible fate than the one i fear they have reserved for him you mean queried Byrne, and then he stopped, for the realization of just what Terrier did mean swept over him quite suddenly. There was no particular reason why Billy Byrne should have felt toward women the finer sentiments which are so cherished a possession of those men who have been gently born and raised, even after they had learned that all women are not as was the feminine ideal of their boyhood. Billy's mother, always foul-mouthed and quarrelsome, had been a veritable demon when drunk, and drunk she had been whenever she could, by hook or crook, raise the price of whiskey never to billy's recollection had she spoken a word of endearment to him and so terrible that she abused him that even while he was yet a little boy scarce out of babyhood he had learned to view her with a hatred as deep-rooted as in the affection of most little children for their mothers when he had come to man's estate he had defended himself from the woman's brutal assaults as he would have defended himself from another man when she had struck billy had struck back the only thing to his credit being that he never had struck her except in self-defense chastity in women was to him a thing to joke of he did not believe that it existed for he judged other women by the one he knew best his mother and as he hated her so he hated them all he had doubly hated barbara harding since she not only was a woman but a woman of the class he loathed and so it was strange and inexplicable that the suggestion of the girl's probable fate should have affected billy byrne as it did he did not stop to reason about it at all he simply knew that he felt a mad and unreasoning rage against the creatures that had borne the girl away outwardly billy showed no indication of the turmoil that raged within his breast we gotta find her bow he said to terrier we gotta find the skirt ordinarily billy would have blustered about the terrible things he would do to the objects of his wrath when once he had them in his power but now he was strangely quiet only the firm set of the strong chin and the steely glitter of his gray eyes gave token of the iron resolution within Terrier, who had been walking slowly to and fro about the dead men, now called the others to him. Here's their trail, he said. If it's as plain as that all the way, we won't be long in overhauling them. Come along. Before he had the words half out of his mouth, the mucker was forging ahead through the jungle along the well-marked spoor of the samurai. What kind of men do you suppose they are? asked Red Sanders. Malaysian headhunters, unquestionably, replied Terrier. Red Sanders shuddered inwardly. The appellation had a most gruesome sound come on cried terrier and started off after the mucker who already was out of sight in the thick forest red sanders and wisson took a few steps after the frenchman terrier turned once to see that they were following him and then a turn in the trail hid them from his view red sanders stopped damn if i'm going to get my coconut hacked off on any such wild goose chase as this he said to wisson the girl's more than likely dead long ago said the other 
Sure she has returned, Red Sanders, and if we go button into that thicket, we'll be dead too. Ugh, poor Miller, poor Swenson. It's awful. Did you see what they'd done to him besides cutting off their heads? Yes, whispered Wayson, looking suddenly behind him. Red Sanders gave a little start, peering in the direction that his companion had looked. What was it, he whispered. What did you do that for? I thought I'd seen something move there, replied Wisson. For God's sake, let's get out of this, and without waiting for a word of assent from his companion, the sailor turned and ran at breakneck speed along a little path toward the spot where Divine, Blanco, and Boney Sawyer were stationed. When they arrived, Boney was just on the point of setting out for the spring to fetch water, but at sight of the frightened, breathless men, he turned to hear their story. What's up? shouted Divine. You men look as though you've seen a ghost. Where are the others? They're all murdered, and their heads cut off, cried Red Sanders. We found the bunch that got Miller, Swenson, and the girl. They killed them all, and was eaten of them when we jumped them. Before we knew what happened, about a thousand more of the devils came running up. They got us separated, and when we seen Terrier and Byrne killed, we just naturally beat it. God, it was awful. Do you think they will follow you? asked Devon. At the suggestion, every head turned toward the trail down which the two panic-stricken men had just come. At the same moment, a hoarse shout arose from the cove below, and the five looked down to see a scene of wild activity upon the beach. The defection of Terrier's party had been discovered, as well as the absence of the girl and the theft of the provisions. Skipper Sims was dancing about like a madman. His bellowed oaths rolled up the cliffs like thunder. Presently, Ward caught a glimpse of the men at the top of the cliff above him. "'There they are!' he cried. Skipper Sims looked up. "'The swabs!' he shrieked. "'A stealin' of our grub and a ductin' of that portal girl. "'The swabs! Let me to em, I say. Just let me to em.' "'We'd all better get to em, said Ward. "'We've got a fight on here, sure. "'Gather up some rocks, men, and come along. "'Skipper, you're too fat to do any fightin' on that there hillside, "'so you better stay here and let one of the men take your gun.' "'For Ward knew so well the metal of his superior "'that he much preferred his absence to his presence in the face of a real fighting, "'and with the gun in the hands of a braver man it would be vastly more effective. "'Ward himself was no lover of a fight, "'but he saw now that starvation might stare them in the face with their food gone.' and everything be lost with the loss of it all. For food and money, a much more cowardly man than Bender Ward would fight to the death. Up the face of the cliff they hurried, expecting momentarily to be either challenged or fired upon by those above them. Divine and his party looked down with mixed emotions upon those who were ascending in so threatening a manner. They found themselves truly between the devil and the deep sea. Ward and his men were halfway up the cliff, yet Divine had made no move to repel them. He glanced timorously toward the dark forest behind, from which he momentarily expected to see the savage, snarling faces of the headhunters appear. "'Surrender, you swabs,' called Ward from below, "'or we'll string the last mother's son of you to the yard-arm.' For reply, Blanco hurled a heavy fragment of rock at the assaulters. It grazed perilously close to Ward, against whom Blanco cherished a keen hatred. Instantly, Ward's revolver barked. The bullet whistled close by Divine's head. Lieutenant Courtright Divine, cotillion leader, ducked behind Terrier's breastwork, where he lay sprawled upon his belly, trembling in terror. Boney Sawyer and Red Sanders followed the example of their commander. Blanco and Wisson alone made any attempt to repel the assault. The big negro ran to Divine's side and snatched the terror-stricken man's revolver from his belt. Then turning, he fired at Ward. The bullet missing its intended victim pierced the heart of a sailor directly behind him. As the man crumpled to the ground, rolling down the steep declivity, his fellows sought cover. Wisson followed up the advantage with a shower of well-aimed missiles, and then hostilities ceased temporarily. "'Have they gone?' queried Divine, with trembling lips, noticing the quiet that followed the shot. "'God nothing, you big coward,' replied Blanco. "'Do you done suppose that two men is going to stave off five? "'If your white-livered skunks ever get up a fight, we might have a chance to—' I has a good mind to cut out your cowardly heart for you, that's what I has, and lying there on your belly settin' that kind of example to your men. Divine's terror had placed him beyond the reach of contumely or reproach. What's the use of fighting them, he whimpered. We should never have left them. It was all the fault of that fool terrier. What can we do against the savages of this awful island if we divide our forces? They will pick us off a few at a time, just as they picked off Miller and Swenson, Terrier and Byrne. We ought to tell Ward about it and call this foolish battle off. Now you're talking, cried Boney Sawyer. I'm not a going to squat up here any longer, with my friends a-shootin' at me from below, and a lot of wild heathen creeping down on me from above to cut off my bloomin' head. Same here, chimed in Red Sanders. 
Blanco turned toward Wisson. For his own part, the Negro would not have been averse to returning to the fold could the thing be accomplished without danger of reprisal on the part of Skipper Sims and Ward. But he knew the men so well that he feared to trust them, even should they seemingly acquiesce to any such proposal. On the other hand, he reasoned, it would be much to their advantage to have the deserters return to them as it would for the deserters themselves. For when they heard the story told by Red Sanders and Wisson of the murder of the others of the party, they too would realize the necessity for maintaining the strength of the little company to its fullest. "'I don't see that we're going to gain nothing by fighting them,' said Wisson. "'There ain't nothing in it any more know-how for nobody since the girl's gone. Let's chuck it and see what terms we can make with Squinty.' "'Well,' grumbled the negro, "'I can't fight him alone. What you doing there, Boney?' During the conversation, Boney Sawyer had been busy with a stick and a piece of rag, and now, as he turned toward his companions once more, they saw that he was raking a white flag of surrender. None interfered as he raised it above the edge of the breastwork. Immediately there was a hail from below. It was Ward's voice. Surrendering, eh? Come into your senses, are you? he shouted. Divine, feeling that immediate danger from bullets was past, raised his head above the edge of the earthwork. You have something to communicate, Mr. Ward, he called. Spit it out, then. I'm a-listening, called back the mate. Miss Harding, Mr. Terrier, Byrne, Miller, and Swenson have been captured and killed by native headhunters, said Divine. Ward's eyes went wide, and he blew out his cheeks in surprise. Then his face went black with an angry scowl. You see what you've done now, you blitherin' fools, you, he cried, with your funny business. you have gone and killed the goose that laid the golden eggs. Thought you'd get it all, didn't you? And now nobody get nothing, unless it is the halter. Nice lot of numbskulls you'd be, and whimpering round now, expecting us to take you back. Well, I reckon not. Not on your measly lives. And with that, he raised his revolver to fire again at Divine. The society man toppled over backward into the pit behind the breastwork before Ward got the chance to pull the trigger. Hold on there, mate, called Boney Sawyer. There ain't no callin' now for getting excited. Wait until you hear all we gotta say. You can't blame us poor sailor men. It was this here fool dude and that scoundrel terrier that put us up to it. They told us that you and Skipper Sims was a fixin' to double cross us all and leave us here to starve on this godforsaken island. Terrier said he was with you when you planned it, that you wanted to get rid of as many of us as you could so that there'd have more of a ransom to divide. So all we'd done was in self defense as it were. Why not let bygones be bygones, and all of us join forces again these murdering heathen? There won't be too many of us at best. Red and Wiston seen more than two thousand of the man eaten devils. They are creeping up on us from behind, right this minute, and you can lay to that. The chances are they've got some special kind of route into that cove, and maybe they are watching at you right now. Ward turned a apprehensive glance to either side. There was logic in Boney's proposal. They couldn't spare a man now. Later he can punish the offenders at his leisure, when he didn't need them any further. Will you swear on the book to do your duty by Skipper Sims and me if we take you back, asked Ward? You bet, answered Boney Sawyer. The others nodded their heads, and Divine sprang up and started down towards Ward. "'Hole on you,' commanded the mate. "'This here arrangement don't include you. It's just between Skipper Sims and his sailors. You're a rank outsider, and you butts in and starts a mutiny. If you come back, you gotta stand trial for that, see?' "'You better duck, mister,' advised Red Sanders. "'They'll hang you sure.' Divine went white. To face trial before two such men as Sims and Ward meant death. Of that he was positive. To flee into the forest meant death almost equally certain and much more horrible the man went to his knees lifting supplicating hands to the maid for god's sake ward he cried be merciful i was led into this by terrier he lied to me just as he did to the man you can't kill me it would be murder they'd hang you for it we'll hang for this musky got us into anyway if we're ever caught growled the mate if you had carried the girl off to be murdered we might have had enough ransom money to have gotten clear some way and now you've gone and cooked the whole goose for the lot of us you can collect the ransom on me, cried Divine, clutching at a straw. I'll pay a hundred thousand myself. You set me down in a civilized port, safe and free. Ward laughed in his face. You ain't got a cent, you four-flusher, he cried. Clinker puts us next to that long before we sail from Frisco. Clinker lies, cried Divine. He doesn't know anything about it. I'm rich. What's the use of chewing de rag about all this, cried Blanco, seeing where he might square himself with Ward and Sims easily. Does you take back all us sailor men, Mr. Ward, and promise not to punish none of us if we swear to stick by you in the future? Yes, replied the mate. Blanco took a step toward the vine. Then you come along, too, as a prisoner, white man, and the burly black grasped the vine by the scuff of the neck and forced him before him down the steep trail toward the cove. 
and so the mutineers returned to the command of skipper simms and lieutenant courtright divine went with them as a prisoner charged with a crime the punishment of which has been death since men sailed the sea End of chapter ten Chapter eleven of The Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. The Village of Yoka. For several minutes Barbara Harding lay where she had collapsed after the keen short sword of the daimyo had freed her from the menace of his lust. She was in a half stupor that took cognizance only of a freezing terror and exhaustion. Presently, however, she became aware of her contact with the corpse beside her and with a stifled cry she shrank away from it. Slowly the girl regained her self-control, and with it came the realization of the extremity of her danger. She rose to a sitting posture and turned her wide eyes toward the doorway to the adjoining room. The women and children seemed yet wrapped in slumber. It was evident that the man's scream had not disturbed them. Barbara gained her feet and moved softly to the doorway. She wondered if she could cross the intervening space to the outer exit without detection. Once in the open she could flee to the jungle, and then there was a chance at least that she might find her way to the coast and terrier. She gripped the short sword which she still held, and took a step into the larger room. One of the women turned and half roused from sleep. The girl shrank back into the darkness of the chamber she had just quitted. The woman sat up and looked around. Then she rose and threw some sticks upon the fire that burned at one side of the dwelling. She crossed to a shelf and took down a cooking utensil. Barbara saw that she was about to commence the preparation of breakfast. All hope of escape was thus ended, and the girl cautiously closed the door between the two rooms. And then she felt about the smaller apartment for some heavy object with which to barricade herself, but her search was fruitless. Finally she bethought herself of the corpse. That would hold the door against the accident of a child or dog pushing it open. It would be better than nothing. But could she bring herself to touch the loathsome thing? The instinct of self-preservation will work wonders even with a frail and delicate woman. Barbara Harding steeled herself to the task, and after several moments of effort she succeeded in rolling the dead man against the door. The scraping sound of the body as she dragged it into position had sent cold shivers running up her spine. She had removed the man's long sword and armor before attempting to move him, and now she crouched beside the corpse with both the swords beside her. She would sell her life dearly. Terrier's words came back to her now as they had when she was struggling in the water after the wreck of the half-moon, but, by George, I intend to go down fighting. Well, she could do no less. She can hear the movement of several persons in the next room now. The voices of women and children came to her distinctly. Many of the words were Japanese, but others were of a tongue with which she was not familiar. Presently her own chamber began to lighten. She looked over her shoulder and saw the first faint rays of dawn showing through the small aperture near the roof and at the opposite end of the room. She rose and moved quickly toward it. By standing on tiptoe and pulling herself up a trifle, with her hands upon the sill, she was able to raise her eyes above the bottom of the window frame. Beyond, she saw the forest, not a hundred yards away, but when she attempted to crawl through the opening, she discovered to her chagrin that it was too small to permit the passage of her body, and then there came a knocking on the door she had just quitted, and a woman's voice calling her lord and master to his morning meal. Barbara ran quickly across the chamber to the door, the long sword raised above her head in both hands. Again the woman knocked this time much louder, and raised her voice as she called again upon Oda Yorimoto to come out. The girl within was panic-stricken. What should she do? With but a little respite, she might enlarge the window sufficiently to permit her to escape into the forest, but the woman at the door evidently would not be denied. Suddenly an inspiration came to her. It was a forlorn hope, but well worth putting to the test. Hush! she hissed through the closed door. Oda Yorimoto sleeps. It is his wish that he not be disturbed. For a moment there was silence beyond the door. And then the woman grunted, and Barbara heard her turn back, muttering to herself. The girl breathed a deep sigh of relief. She had received a brief reprieve from death. Again she turned to the window, where, with the short sword, she commenced her labor of enlarging it to permit the passage of her body. The work was necessarily slow because of the fact that it must proceed with utter noiselessness. For an hour she worked, and then again came an interruption at the door. This time it was a man. Oda Yorimoto still sleeps, whispered the girl. Go away and do not disturb him. He will be very angry if you awaken him. But the man would not be put off so easily as had the woman. He still insisted. The daimyo had ordered that there should be a great hunt today, for the heads of the Sayojin, who have landed upon Yoka, persisted the man. He will be angry indeed if we do not call him in time to accomplish the task today. Let me speak with him, woman. I do not believe that Oda Yorimoto still sleeps. 
Why should I believe one of the Seiyojin? It may be that you have bewitched the daimyo. And with that he pushed against the door. The corpse gave a little, and the man glued his eyes to the aperture. Barbara held a sword behind her, and with her shoulder against the door, attempted to reclose it. Go away, she cried. I shall be killed if you awaken Odi or Moto, and if you enter, you too shall be killed. The man stepped back from the door, and Barbara could hear him in a low converse with some of the women of the household. A moment later he returned, and without a word of warning he threw his whole weight against the portal. The corpse slipped back enough to permit the entrance of the man's body, and as he stumbled into the room the long sword of the Lord of Yoka fell full and keen across the back of his brown neck. Without a sound he lunged to the floor, dead, but the woman without had caught a fleeting glimpse of what had taken place within the little chamber, even before Barbara Harding had slammed the door again, and with shrieks of rage and fright they rushed into the main street of the village, shouting at the top of their voices that Odi Yorimoto and Hawa Nisho had been slain by the woman of the Seiyojin. Instantly the village swarmed it with samurai, women, children, and dogs. They rushed toward the hut of Oda Yorimoto, filling the outer chamber where they jabbered excitedly for several minutes, the warriors attempting to obtain a coherent story from the moaning women of the daimyo's household. Barbara Harding crouched close to the door, listening. She knew that the crucial moment was at hand, and that there were at best but a few moments for her to live. A silent prayer rose from her parted lips. She placed the sharp point of Oda Yorimoto's short sword against her breast, and waited, waiting for the coming of the men from the room beyond snatching a few brief seconds from eternity ere she drove the weapon into her heart. Terrier plunged through the jungle at a run for several minutes before he caught sight of the mucker. "'Are you still on the trail?' he called to the man before him. "'Sure,' replied Byrne. "'It's dead easy. They must have been at least a dozen of them. Even a mutt like me couldn't miss it.' "'We want to go carefully, Byrne,' cautioned Terrier. "'I've had experience with these fellows before, and I can tell you that you never know one of them is near you till you feel a spear in your back.' unless you're almighty watchful. We've got to make all the haste we can, of course, but it won't help Miss Harding any if we rush into an ambush and get our heads lopped off. Byrne saw the wisdom of his companion's advice and tried to profit by it, but something which seemed to dominate him today carried him ahead at reckless, breakneck speed. The flight of an eagle would have been all too slow to meet the requirement of his unaccountable haste. Once he found himself wondering why he was risking his life to avenge or rescue this girl whom he hated so. He tried to think that it was for the ransom. Yes, that was it, the ransom. If he found her alive and rescued her, he should claim the lion's share of the booty. Terrier, too, wondered why Byrne, of all the other men of the half-moon, the last that he should have expected to risk a thing for the sake of Miss Harding, should be the foremost in pursuit of her captors. "'I wonder how far behind Sanders and Wisson are,' he remarked to Byrne, after they had been on the trail for the better part of an hour. "'Hadn't we better wait for them to catch up with us?' Four could do a whole lot more than two. Not when Billy Burns wanted two, replied the mucker, and continually dogged along the trail. Another half hour brought them suddenly in sight of a native village, and Billy Byrne was for dashing straight into the center of it and cleaning it up as he put it. But Terrier put his foot down firmly on that proposition, and finally Byrne saw that the other was right. The trail leads straight toward that place, said Terrier, so I suppose here is where they brought her but which of the huts she's in now we ought to try to determine before we make any attempt to rescue her. Well, by George, now what do you think of that? Tinkle what? asked the mutter. What's eatin' ye? See those three men down there in the village, Burn? asked the Frenchman. They're no more aboriginal headhunters than I am. They're Japs, man. There must be something wrong with our trailing, for it's as certain as fate itself that Japs are not headhunters. There ain't been nothin' phony about our trailin', Bo, insisted Burn and whether Japs are bean collectors or not, here's where the ginks that cop the doll hiked fur, and if they ain't there now, it's because they went true and out the other side, see? Hush, Burn, whispered Terrier. Drop down behind the bush. Someone is coming along this other trail to the right of us, and as he spoke he dragged the mucker down beside him. For a moment they crouched, breathless and expectant, and then the slim figure of an almost nude boy emerged from the foliage, close beside and entered the trail toward the village. Upon his head he bore a bundle of firewood. When he was directly opposite the watchers, Terrier sprang suddenly upon him, clapping a silencing hand over the boy's mouth. In Japanese he whispered a command for silence. "'We shall not harm you if you keep still,' he said, and answer our questions truthfully. What village is that?' "'It is the chief city of Oda Yorimoto, Lord of Yoka,' replied the youth. "'I am Odo Isaka, his son, and the large hut in the center of the village street is the palace of Oda Yorimoto?' guessed Terrier shrewdly. It is. 
the frenchman was not unversed in the ways of orientals and he guessed also that if the white girl was still alive in the village she would be in no other hut than that of the most powerful chief but he wished to verify his deductions if possible he knew that a direct question as to the whereabouts of the girl would call forth either a clever oriental evasion or an equally clever oriental lie does Odi Yorimoto intend slaying the white woman that was brought to his house last night asked Arya. how should the son know the intentions of his father replied the boy is she still alive continued terrier how should i know who was asleep when she was brought and only heard the women folk this morning whisper that odi yorimoto had brought home a new woman the night before could you not see her with your own eyes asked terrier my eyes cannot pass through the door of the little room behind in which they still were when i left to gather firewood a half hour since retorted the youth what's the chink saying asked billy byrne impatient of the conversation no word of which was intelligible to him he says in substance replied terrier with a grin that miss harding is still alive and in the back room of that largest hut in the center of the village street but and his face clouded odi yorimoto the chief of the tribe is with her the mucker sprang to his feet with an oath and would have bolted for the village had not terrier laid a detaining hand upon his shoulder it is too late my friend he said sadly to make haste now we may if we are cautious be able to save her life and later possibly avenge her wrong let us act coolly and after some manner of plan so that we may work together and not throw our lives away uselessly the chance is that neither of us will come out of that village alive but we must minimize that chance to the utmost if we are to serve miss harding well what's the word asked the mucker for he saw that terrier was right the jungle approaches the village most closely on the opposite side the side in rear of the chief's hut pointed out terrier we must circle about until we can reach that point undetected then we may formulate further plans from what our observations there develop and dis burnish of the thumb at oda isaka we'll take him with us it wouldn't be safe to let him go now why not croak him suggested Byrne. not unless we have to replied terrier he's just a boy we'll doubtless have all the killing we want among the men before we get out of this i never did have no use for chinks said the mucker as though in extenuation of the suggestion that they murder the youth for some unaccountable reason he had felt a sudden compunction because of his thoughtless remark what in the world was coming over him he wondered he'd be wearing white pants and playing lawn tennis presently if he continued to grow much softer and more unmanly so the three set out through the jungle following a trail which led around to the north of the village terrier walked ahead with the boy's arm in his grasp byrne followed closely behind they reached their destination in the rear of odi yorimoto's palace without interruption or detection here they reconnoitered through the thick foliage there's a little winder in the back of the house said byrne that must be where dem guys cooped up the little broiler yes said terrier it would be in the back room which the boy described first let's tie and gag this young heathen then we can proceed to business without fear of alarm from him and the frenchman stripped a long grass rope from about the waist of his prisoner with which he was securely trussed up a piece of his loincloth being forced into his mouth as a gag and secured there by another strip torn from the same garment which was passed around the back of the boy's head rather uncomfortable i imagine commented terrier but not particularly painful or dangerous and now to business i'm going to make a break for dat winder announced the mucker and you squat here in de tall grass would you get and pick off any fresh guys that get gay in back here then if i need yous you can come a-runnin and open up all over the shop with the artillery or if i get the lizzie out in de jug and de chinks push me too close yous'll be here and you can pick em off easy like you'll be taking all the risk that way burn objected terrier and that's not fair one of us is pretty sure to get hurted explained the mucker in defense of his plan and if it's a croak it's a lot better to be me than yous for the girl won't be crazy about being left alone with me she ain't got no use for the likes of me now yous are her kin and so you stay here where you can help her after i get her out I don't want nothing to do with her anyhow. She gives me a swift pain, and, he added as though or an afterthought, I ain't got no use for dat ransom eater. You can have dat too. Hold on, Byrne, cried Terrier. I have something to say too. I do not see how I can expect you to believe me, but under the circumstances, when one of us, and maybe both, are pretty sure to die before the day is much older, it wouldn't be worth while lying. I do not want that damned ransom any more either. I only want to do what I can to right the wrong that I have helped to perpetuate against Miss Harding. I, I, Byrne, I love her. I shall never tell her so, for I am not the sort of man a decent girl could care to marry. But I did want the chance to make a clean breast to her of all my connection with the whole dirty business, and get her forgiveness if I could. 
but first i wanted to prove my repentance by helping her to civilization in safety and delivering her to her friends without the payment of a cent of money i may never be able to do that now but if i die in the attempt and you don't i wish that you would tell her what i have just told you paint me as black as you can you couldn't commence to make me as black as i have been but let her know that for love of her i turned white at the last minute Byrne, she is the best girl that you or i ever saw we're not fit to breathe the same air that she breathes now you can see why i should like to go first i taught yous with soft honor replied the mucker and dat's the reason why yous oughter not go first but what's the use of chewin let's flip a coin to see which goes and which stays got one terrier felt in his trousers pocket fishing out a dime heads you go tails i go he said and spun the silver piece in the air catching it in the flat of his open palm it's heads said the mucker grinning gee what's the racket both men turned toward the village where a jabbering mob of half-caste japanese had suddenly appeared in the streets hurrying toward the hut of oda yurimoto something doing eh said the mucker well here goes salaam and he broke from the cover of the jungle and dashed across the clearing toward the rear of oda yurimoto's hut End of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of The Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. The Fight in the Palace. Barbara Harding heard the samurai in the room beyond her prison advancing toward the door that separated them from her. She pressed the point of the daimyo sword close to her heart. A heavy knock fell upon the door, and at the same instant the girl was startled by a noise behind her, a noise at the window at the far end of the room turning to face this new danger she was startled into a little cry of surprise to see the head and shoulders of the mucker framed in the broken square of the half-demolished window the girl did not know whether to feel renewed hope or utter despair she could not forget the heroism of her rescue by this brutal fellow when the half moon had gone to pieces the day before nor could she banish from her mind his threats of violence toward her or his brutal treatment of mallory and terrier and the question arose in her mind as to whether she would be any better off in his power than in the clutches of the savage samurai. Billy Byrne had heard the knock upon the door before which the girl knelt. He had seen the corpses of the dead men at her feet. He had observed the telltale position of the sword which the girl held to her breast, and he had read much of the story of the impending tragedy at a glance. Cheer up, kid, he whispered. I'll be with you in a minute, and Terrier's out here too, to help you if I can't do it alone. The girl turned toward the door again. Wait, she cried to the samurai upon the other side, until I move the dead men. Then you may come in. Their bodies bar the door now. All that kept the warriors out was the fear that possibly Oda Yorimoto might not be dead after all, and that should they force their way into the room without his permission, some of them would suffer for their temerity. Naturally, none of them was keen to lose his head for nothing, but the moment that the girl spoke of the dead men, they knew that Oda Yorimoto had been slain, too, and with one accord they rushed the little door. The girl threw all her weight against her side, while the dead men, each to the extent of his own weight, aided the woman who had killed them in her effort to repulse their fellows and behind the three billy byrne kicked and tore at the mud wall about the window in a frantic effort to enlarge the aperture sufficiently to permit his huge bulk to pass through into the little room the mucker won to the girl's side first and snatching oda yorimoto's long sword from the floor he threw his great weight against the door and commanded the girl to make for the window and escape to the forest as quickly as she could terrier is waiting there he said he will see you the moment you reach the window and then you will be safe but you cried the girl what of you never you mind me commanded billy byrne you just do as i tell you see now beat it and he gave her a rough shove toward the window and then between the combined efforts of the samurai upon one side and billy byrne of kelly's gang upon the other the frail door burst from its rotten hinges and fell to one side the first of the samurai into the little room was cleft from crown to breastbone with the keen edge of the sword of the lord of yoka wielded by the mighty arm of the mucker the second took the count with the left hook to the jaw and then all that could crowd through the little door swarmed upon the husky bruiser from grand avenue barbara harding took one look at the carnage behind her and then sprang to the window at a short distance she saw the jungle and at its edge what she was sure was the figure of a man crouching in the long grass mr terrier she cried quick they are killing Byrne!" and then she turned back into the room and with the short sword with which she still grasped in her hand sprang to the side of the mucker who was offering his life to save her Byrne cast a horrified glance at the figure fighting by his side for the love of mike beat it he cried duck get out of here but the girl only smiled up bravely into his face and kept her place beside him the mucker tried to push her behind him with one hand while he fought with the other 
but she drew away from him to come up again a little further from him. The samurai were pushing them closely now. Three men at a time were reaching for the mucker with their long swords. He was bleeding from numerous wounds, but at his feet lay two dead warriors, while a third crawled away with a mortal wound in his abdomen. Barbara Harding devoted her energies to thrusting and cutting at those who tried to press past the mucker, that they might take him from behind. The battle could not last long, so unequal were the odds. She saw the room beyond filled with surging warriors, all trying to force their way within reach of the great white man who battled like some demigod of old in the close, dark, evil warren of the daimyo. She shot a side glance at the man. He was wonderful. The fire of battle had transformed him. No longer was he the sullen, sulky, hulking brute she had first known upon the half-moon. Instead, huge, muscular, alert, he towered above his pygmy antagonists, his gray eyes gleaming, a half-smile upon his strong lips. She saw the longsword, wielded awkwardly in his unaccustomed hands, beat down the weapons of his skilled foemen by the very ferocity of its hurtling attack. She saw it pass through a man's shoulders, cleaving bone and muscle as if it had been cheese, until it stopped two-thirds across its victim's body, cutting him almost in two. She saw a samurai leap past her champion's guard in an attempt to close upon him with a dagger, and when she had rushed forward to thwart the fellow's design, she had seen Burden swing his mighty left to the warrior's face with a blow that might well have felled an ox. Then another leapt into closer quarters as he saw Burn at the same instant bury his sword in the body of a dark-visaged devil who looked more Malay than Jap, and as the stricken man fell she saw the hilt of the mucker's blade wrenched from his grip by the dead body of his foe. The samurai who had closed upon Byrne at that instant found his enemy unarmed, and with a howl of delight he struck full at the broad chest with his long, thin dagger. But Billy Byrne was not to be dispatched so easily. With his left forearm he struck up the hand that wielded the menacing blade, and then, catching the fellow by the shoulder, swung him around, grasped him about the waist and lifted him above his head, hurled him full in the faces of the swordsmen who were pressing through the narrow doorway. Almost simultaneously a spear shot through a tiny opening in the ranks before Billy Byrne, and with a little gasp of dismay the huge fellow pitched forward upon his face. At the same instant a shot rang out behind Barbara Harding, and Terrier leapt past her to stand across the body of the fallen mucker. With the sound of the shot a samurai sank to the floor, dead, and the others, unaccustomed to firearms, drew back in dismay. Again Terrier fired point-blank into the crowded room, and this time two men fell, struck by the same bullet. Once more the warriors retreated, and with an exultant yell, Terrier followed up his advantage by charging menacingly upon them. They stood for a moment, then wavered, turned and fled from the hut. When Terrier turned back toward Barbara Harding, he found her kneeling beside the mucker. "'Is he dead?' asked the Frenchman. "'No. Can we lift him together and get him through that window?' "'It is the only way,' replied Terrier, "'and we must try it.' They seized upon the huge body and dragged it to the far end of the room but despite their best efforts the two were not able to lift the great inert mass of flesh and bone and muscle and pass it through the tiny opening what shall we do cried terrier we must stay here with him replied barbara harding i can never desert the man who fought so noble a fight for me while a breath of life remained in him terrier groaned nor i he said but you he has given his life to save yours should you render his sacrifice of no avail now i cannot go alone she answered simply and i know that you will not leave him there is no other way. We must stay. At this juncture the mucker opened his eyes. Who hit me? he murmured. Just show me de big stiff. Terrier could not repress a smile, and Barbara Harding again knelt beside the man. No one hit you, Mr. Byrne, she said. You were struck by a spear and are badly wounded. Billy Byrne opened his eyes a little wider, turning them until they rested on the beautiful face of the girl so close to his. Mr. Byrne, he ejaculated in disgust, forget it. What do you think I am, one of those paper-collared dudes? Then he sat up, blood flowing from a wound in his chest, saturating his shirt, and running slowly to the earth floor. There were two flesh wounds upon his head, one above the right eye, and the other extending entirely across the left cheek from below the eye to the lobe of the ear. But these he had received earlier in the fracas. From crown to heel the man was a mass of blood. Through his crimson mask he looked at the pile of bodies in the far end of the room, and a broad grin cracked the dried blood about his mouth. "'What we done to them chinks was sure a plenty, kiddo,' he remarked to Miss Harding, and then he came to his feet, seemingly as strong as ever, shaking himself like a great bull. "'But I guess it's lucky you's buttoned it up when you did, old pot,' he added, turning toward Terrier. "'They just about had me down for the long count.' Barbara Harding was looking at the man in wide-eyed amazement. A moment before she had been expecting him, momentarily, to breathe his last, 
now he was standing before her talking as unconcernedly as though he had not received a scratch he seemed totally unaware of his wounds at least he was entirely indifferent to them you're pretty badly hurt old man said terrier do you feel able to make the attempt to get to the jungle the japs will be back in any moment sure cried billy byrne come ahead and he sprang from the window pass the kid up to me quick they're coming from him back terrier lifted barbara harding to the mucker who threw her through the opening then Billy extended a hand to the Frenchman, and in a moment later the three stood together outside the hut. A dozen samurai were running toward them from around the end of the palace. The jungle lay a hundred yards across the clearing. There was no time to be lost. "'You go first with Miss Harding,' cried Terrier. "'I'll cover our retreat with my revolver, following close behind you.' The mucker caught the girl in his arms, throwing her across his shoulder. The blood from his wounds smeared her hands and clothing. "'Hang tight, kiddo,' he cried, and started at a brisk trot toward the forest. Terrier kept close behind the two, reserving his fire until it could be effectively delivered. With savage yells, the samurai leaped after their escaping quarry. The natives all carry the long, sharp spears of the aboriginal head-honors. Their swords swung in their harness, and their ancient armor clanked as they ran. It was a strange, weird picture that the oddly contrasted party presented as they raced across the clearing of this forgotten island, toward the jungle as primitive as when the evening and the morning were the third day. An American girl of the highest social caste, born in the arms of the most vicious of all social pariahs, the criminal mucker of the slums of the great city, and defending them with drawn revolver, a French count and soldier of fortune, while in their wake streamed a yelling pack of half-caste demons clothed in the habiliment of sixteenth-century Japan, and wielding the barbarous spears of the savage head-hunting aborigines, whose fierce blood coursed in their veins with that of the descendants of the Takamimusa Inokami. Three quarters of the distance had been covered in safely before the samurai came within the safe spear range of the trio. Terrier, seeing the danger to the girl, dropped back a few paces, hoping to hold the brown warriors from her. The foremost of the pursuers raised their weapons aloft, carrying his spear hand back of the shoulder for the throw. Terrier's revolver spoke, and the man pitched forward, rolling over and over before he came to rest. A howl of rage went up from the samurai, and a half-dozen spears leapt at long range toward Terrier. One of the weapons transfixed his thigh, bringing him to earth. Byrne was at the forest's edge as the Frenchman fell. It was the girl, though, who witnessed the catastrophe. Stop, she cried. Mr. Terrier is down. The mucker halted and turned his head in the direction of the Frenchman, who had raised himself to one elbow and was firing at the advancing enemy. He dropped the girl to her feet. Wait here, he commanded, and sprang back towards Terrier. Before he reached him, another spear had caught the man full in the chest, toppling him, unconscious, to the earth. The samurai were rushing rapidly upon the wounded officer. It was a question who would reach him first. Terrier had been nipped in the act of reloading his revolver. It lay beside him now, the cylinder full of fresh cartridges. The mucker was first to his side, and snatching the weapon from the ground, fired coolly and rapidly at the advancing Japanese. Four of them went down before the deadly fusillade, but the mucker cursed beneath his breath because of his two misses. Byrne's stand checked the brown men momentarily, and in the succeeding lull the man lifted the unconscious Frenchman to his shoulder and bore him back to the forest. In the shelter of the jungle they laid him upon the ground. To the girl it seemed that the frightful wound in his chest must prove fatal within a few moments. Byrne, apparently unmoved by the seriousness of Terrier's condition, removed the man's cartridge belt and buckled it about his own waist, replacing the six empty shells in the revolver with six fresh ones. Presently he noticed the bound and gagged Oda Isaka lying in the brush behind them where he and Terrier had left him. The samurai were now sneaking cautiously toward the refuge. A sudden inspiration came to the mucker. Didn't I hear you chewin' de rag with the chinks when I hit the dump over there? He asked of Barbara. The girl oddly understood him. She nodded her head affirmatively. You savvy der lingo then, eh? A little. Tell this Kazimbat to wise his pals to the fact that I'll croak em if they don't beat it and let us make our getaway. Terrier says as how he's kink when his old man croaks, and his old man was the guy you's put to sleep in the chicken coop, explained the mucker, lucidly, so dis slob's kink himself now. Barbara Harding was quick to see the strength of the man's suggestion. Stepping to the edge of the clearing in full view of the advancing enemy, with the mucker at her side, revolver in hand, she called to them in the language of their forebears to listen to her message. Then she explained that they held the son of Oda Yuramoto prisoner, and that his life would be the price of any further attack upon them. The samurai conferred together for a moment, then one of them called out that they did not believe her, that Oda Iseka, son of Oda Yuramoto, was safe in the village. Wait, replied the girl, we will show him to you, and turning to Byrne, she asked him to fetch the youth. When the white man returned with the boy in his arms, a wail of mingled anguish and rage rose from the natives. If you molest us no further, we shall not harm him, cried Barbara, and when we leave your island, we shall set him free. 
but renew your attack upon us and this white man who holds him says he will cut out his heart and feed it to the fox which was rather a bloodthirsty statement for so gentle a character as barbara harding but she knew enough of the superstitious fears of the ancient japanese to feel confident that this threat would have considerable weight with the subjects of the young lord of yoka again the natives conferred in whispers finally he who had acted as spokesman before turned toward the strangers we shall not harm you he said so long as you do not harm oda Iseka. but we shall watch you always until you leave the island and if harm befalls him then you shall never leave for we shall kill you all barbara translated the man's words to the mucker do you use fall for dat he asked i think they will be careful to make no open assault upon us replied the girl but never for an instant must we cease our watchfulness for at the first opportunity i am sure they will murder us they turned back to terrier now the man still lay unconscious and moaning where byrne had deposited him the mucker removed the gag from oda isika's mouth which way is water ask him he said to barbara the girl put the question he says that straight up this ravine behind us there is a little spring translated the girl byrne lifted terrier in his arms after loosening oda isika's feet and tethering him to his own belt with the same grass rope then he motioned the youth up the ravine walk beside me he said to barbara and keep your lamps peeled behind thus in silence the party commenced the ascent of the trail which soon became rough and precipitous while behind them under cover of the brush sneaked four trailing samurai after half an hour of the most arduous climbing the mucker commenced to feel the effect of loss of blood from his many wounds he coughed a little now from the exertion and when he did the blood spurted anew from the fresh wound in his breast yet there was no wavering or weakness apparent to the girl who marched beside him and she wondered at the physical endurance of the man but when at last they came to a clear pool of water half hidden by overhanging rocks and long masses of depending mosses in the midst of a natural grotto of enchanting loveliness and oda isika signalled that their journey was at an end byrne laid terrier gently upon the flower-starred sward and with a little choking gasp collapsed unconscious beside the frenchman barbara harding was horror-stricken she suddenly realized that she had commenced to feel that this giant of the slums was invulnerable and with the thought came another that to him she had come to look more to terrier for eventual rescue and now here she found herself in the center of a savage island surrounded as she felt confident she was by skulking murderers with only two dying white men and a brown hostage as companions and now oda isika took in the situation and with a grin of triumph raised his voice in a loud halloo come quickly my people he cried for both the white men are dying and from the jungle below them came an answering shout we come oda isika lord of yoka your faithful samurai come end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the mucker by edgar rice burroughs this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by joe denoyer somerset new jersey a gentleman of france at the sound of the harsh voices so close upon her barbara harding was galvanized into instant action springing to byrne's side she whipped terrier's revolver from his belt where it reposed upon the fallen mucker's hips and with it turned like a tigress upon the youth quick she cried tell them to go back that i shall kill you if they come closer the boy shrank back in terror before the fiery eyes and menacing attitude of the white girl and then with the terror that animated him ringing plainly in his voice he screamed to his henchman to halt relieved for a moment at least from the immediate danger barbara harding turned her attention toward the two unconscious men at her feet from appearances it seemed that either might breathe his last at any moment and as she looked at terrier a wave of compassion swept over her and the tears welled to her eyes yet it was to the mucker that she first ministered why she could not for the life of her have explained she dashed cold water from the spring upon his face she bathed his wrists and washed his wounds tearing strips from her skirt to bandage the horrid gash upon his breast in an effort to staunch the flow of life-blood that rolled forth with the man's every breath and at last she was rewarded by seeing the flow of blood quelled and signs of returning consciousness appear the mucker opened his eyes close above him bent the radiant vision of barbara harding's face upon his fevered forehead he felt the soothing strokes of her cool soft hand he closed his eyes again to battle with the effeminate realization that he enjoyed this strange new sensation the sensation of being ministered to by a gentlewoman and perished the thought by a gentlewoman with an effort he raised himself to one elbow scowling at her go on he said i ain't no boob dude cut out the mush let me be beat it hurt more than she would have cared to admit barbara harding turned away from her ungrateful and ungracious patient to repeat her ministrations to the frenchman 
The mucker read in her expression something of the wound his words had inflicted, and he lay thinking upon the matter for some time, watching her deft, white fingers as they worked over the scarce breathing terrier. He saw her wash the blood and dirt from the ghastly wound in the man's chest, and as he watched he realized what a world of courage it must require for a woman of her stamp to do gruesome work of this sort. Never before would such a thought have occurred to him. Neither would he have cared at all for the pain his recent words to the girl might have inflicted. Instead, he would have felt keen enjoyment of her discomfiture. And now another strange new emotion took possession of him. It was none other than a desire to atone in some way for his words. What wonderful transformation was taking place in the heart of the Kelly gangster? Say, he blurted out suddenly. Barbara Harding turned questioning eyes toward him. In them was the cold, haughty aloofness again that had marked her cognizance of him upon the half-moon. The look that had made his hate of her burn most fiercely. It took the mucker's breath away to witness it, and it made the speech he had contemplated more difficult than ever, nay, almost impossible. He coughed nervously, and the old, dark, lowering scowl returned to his brow. Did you speak? asked Miss Harding, icily. Billy Byrne cleared his throat, and then there blurted from his lips not the speech that he had intended, but a sudden, hateful rush of words that seemed to emanate from another personality, from one whom Billy Byrne once had been. Ain't that boob croaked yet? he growled. The shock of that brutal question brought Barbara Harding to her feet. In horror she looked down at the man who had spoken thus of a brave and noble comrade in the face of death itself. Her eyes blazed angrily as hot, bitter words rushed to her lips, and then of a sudden she thought of Byrne's self-sacrificing heroism in returning to Terrier's side in the face of the advancing samurai, of the cruel courage he had displayed as he carried the unconscious man back to the jungle, of the devotion, almost superhuman, that had sustained him as he struggled, uncomplaining, up the steep mountain path with the burden of the Frenchman's body, the while his own lifeblood left a crimson trail behind him. Such deeds and these words were incompatible in the same individual. There could be but one explanation. Byrne must be two men, with as totally different characters as though they had possessed separate bodies. And who may say that her hypothesis was not correct? At least it seemed that Billy Byrne was undergoing a metamorphosis, and at the instant there was still a question as to which personality should eventually dominate. Byrne turned away from the reproach, which replaced the horror in the girl's eyes, and with a tired sigh let his head fall upon his outstretched arm. The girl watched him for a moment, a puzzled expression on her face, and then returned to her work above Terrier. The Frenchman's respiration was scarcely appreciable, yet after a time he opened his eyes and looked up wearily. At sight of the girl he smiled wanly and tried to speak, but a fit of coughing flecked his lips with bloody foam, and again he closed his eyes. Fainter and fainter came his breathing, until it was with difficulty that the girl detected any movement of his breast whatsoever. She thought that he was dying, and she was afraid. Wistfully she looked toward the mucker. The man still lay with his head buried in his arm, but whether he were wrapped in thought, in slumber, or in death, the girl could not tell. At the final thought she went white with terror. Slowly she approached the man, and leaning over, placed her hand upon his shoulder. Mr. Byrne, she whispered. The mucker turned his face toward her. It looked tired and haggard. What is it? he asked, and his tone was softer than she had ever heard it. I think Mr. Terrier is dying, she said, and I, I... Oh, I'm so afraid. The man flushed to the roots of his hair. All he could think of were the ugly words he had spoken a short time before, and now Terrier was dying. Byrne would have laughed had anyone suggested that he entertained any other sentiment than hatred toward the second officer of the half-moon, that is, he would have twenty-four hours before. But now, quite unexpectedly, he realized that he didn't want Terrier to die, and then it dawned upon him that a new sentiment had been born within him, a sentiment to which he had been a stranger all his life friendship. He felt friendship for Terrier. It was unthinkable, and yet the mucker knew that it was so. Painfully he crawled over to the Frenchman's side. Terrier, he whispered in the man's ear. The officer turned his head wearily. Do you know me, old pal? asked the mucker, and Barbara Harding knew from the man's voice that there were tears in his eyes. But what she did not know was that they welled there in response to the words the mucker had just spoken, the nearest approach to words of endearment that ever had passed his lips. Terrier reached up and took Byrne's hand. It was evident that he, too, had noted the unusual quality of the mucker's voice. "'Yes, old man,' he said faintly. And then, uh, "'Water, please.' Barbara Harding brought him a drink, holding his head against her knee while he drank. The cool liquid seemed to give him new strength, for presently he spoke, quite strongly. "'I'm going, Byrne,' he said. "'But before I go, I want to tell you that of all the brave men I have ever known, I have learned within the past few days to believe that you are the bravest.' 
A week ago I thought you were a coward. I ask your forgiveness. Forget it, whispered Byrne. For a week ago I guess I was a coward. There seems to be more than one kind of nerve. I'm just a learning of the right kind, I guess. Then Byrne, continued Terrier, don't forget what I asked of you before we tossed up to see who should go enter Oda Yorimoto's house. I'll not forget, said Billy. Goodbye, Byrne, whispered Terrier. Take good care of Miss Harding. Goodbye, old pal, said the mucker. His voice broke, and two big tears rolled down the cheek of the toughest guy on the west side. Barbara Harding stepped to Terrier's side. Goodbye, my friend, she said. God will reward you and your friendship, your bravery, and your devotion. There must be a special honor roll in heaven for such noble men as you. Terrier smiled sadly. Byrne will tell you all, he said, except who I am. He does not know that. Is there any message, my friend, asked the girl, that you would like to have me deliver? Terrier remained silent for a moment, as though thinking. My name, he said, is Henry Terrier. I am the Count de Cadenet of France. There is no message, Miss Harding, other than you see fit to deliver to my relatives. They lived in Paris the last I heard of them. My brother, Jacques, was a deputy. His voice had become so low and weak that the girl could scarce distinguish his words. He gasped once or twice, and then tried to speak again. Barbara leaned closer, her ear almost against his lips. Goodbye, dear, the words almost inaudible, and then the body stiffened with a little convulsive tremor, and Henry Terrier, Count de Cadenet, passed over into the keeping of his noble ancestors. He's gone, whispered the girl, dry-eyed but suffering. She had not loved this man, she realized, but she had learned to think of him as her one true friend in their little world of scoundrels and murderers. She had cared for him very much. It was entirely possible that some day she might have come to return his evident affection for her. She knew nothing of the seamy side of his hard life. She had guessed nothing of the scoundrelly duplicity that had marked his first advances towards her. She thought of him only as a true, brave gentleman, and in that she was right. For whatever Henry Terrier might have been in the past, in the last few days of his life he had revealed to him the true colors that birth and nature had intended him to wear through a brilliant career. In his death he had atoned for many sins. And in those last few days he had transferred, all unknown to himself or the other man, a measure of the gentility and chivalry that were his birthright. For, unrealizing, Billy Byrne was patterning himself after the man he had hated and had come to love. After the girl's announcement, the mucker had continued to sit with bowed head, staring at the ground. Afternoon had deepened into evening, and now the brief twilight of the tropics was upon them. In a few moments it would be dark. Presently Byrne looked up. His eyes wandered about the tiny clearing. Suddenly he staggered to his feet. Barbara Harding sprang up, startled by the evident alarm in the man's attitude. "'What is it? What's the matter?' The chink, he replied. Where is the chink? And sure enough, Odo Isaka had disappeared. The youthful daimyo had taken advantage of the preoccupation of his captors during the last moments of Terrier to gnaw in two the grass rope which bound him to the mucker, and with hands still fast bound behind him had slunk into the jungle path that led toward his village. They will be upon us again now at any moment, whispered the girl. What can we do? We'd better duck, replied the mucker. I hates to run away from a bunch of chinks, but I guess it's up to us to beat it. Poor Mr. Terrier, asked the girl. I'll have to bury him close by, replied the mucker. I don't think I could pack him very far tonight. I don't feel just quite fit again yet. You wouldn't mind much if I buried him here, would you? There is no other way, Mr. Byrne, replied the girl. You mustn't think of trying to carry him far. We have done all we can for poor Mr. Terrier. You have almost given your life for him already, and it wouldn't do any good to carry his dead body with us. I hates to think of them head hut and chinks getting him, replied Byrne but maybe I can hide his grave so they won't tumble upon it. You are in no condition to carry him at all, said the girl. I doubt if you can go far even without any burden. The mucker grinned. You don't know me, miss, he said, and stooped, he lifted the body of the Frenchman to his broad shoulder and started up the hillside through the trackless underbrush. It would have been an impossible feat for an ordinary man in the pink of condition, but the mucker, weak from pain and loss of blood, strode sturdily upward while the marveling girl followed close behind him. A hundred yards above the spring they came upon a little level spot, and here, with the two swords of Odi Yorimoto, which they still carried, they scooped a shallow grave in which they placed all that was mortal of the Count de Cadenet. Barbara Harding whispered a short prayer above the new-made grave, while the mucker stood with bowed head beside her. Then they turned to their flight again up the wild face of the savage mountain. The moon came up at last to lighten the way for them, but it was a rough and dangerous climb at best. In many places they were forced to walk hand in hand for considerable distances, 
and twice the mucker had lifted the girl bodily in his arms to bear her across particularly dangerous or difficult stretches shortly after midnight they struck a small mountain stream up which they followed until in the natural cul-de-sac they came upon its source and found that farther progress barred by precipitous cliffs which rose above them sheer and unscalable they had entered the little amphitheatre through which a narrow rocky pass in the bottom of which the tiny stream flowed and now weak and tired the mucker was forced to admit that he can go no further who'd have taught that i was such a sissy he exclaimed disgustedly i think that you are very wonderful mr byrne replied the girl few men could have gone through what you have today and been alive now the mucker made a depreciatory gesture i suppose we ought to make the best of it he said anyhow this ought to make a swell joint to defend weak as he was he searched about for some soft grasses which he threw in a pile beneath a stunted tree that grew well back in the hollow here's your downery he said with an attempt at jocularity now you better hit the hay for you must be dead fagged thanks replied the girl i am nearly dead so tired was she that she was asleep almost as soon as she had found a comfortable position in the thick mat of grass so that she gave no thought to the strange position in which circumstance had placed her the sun was well up in the following morning before the girl awakened and it was several minutes before she could readjust herself to her strange surroundings at first she thought that she was alone but finally she discerned a giant figure standing at the opening which led from their mountain retreat it was the mucker and at sight of him there swept over the girl the terrible peril of her position alone in the savage mountains of the savage island with the murderer of billy mallory the beast that kicked the unconscious terrier in the face the mucker who had insulted and threatened to strike her she shuddered at the thought and then she recalled the man's other side and for the life of her she could not tell whether to be afraid of him or not it all depended upon what mood governed him it would be best to propitiate him she called a pleasant good morning byrne turned she was shocked at the pallor of his haggard face good morning he said how did you sleep oh just splendidly and you she replied so so he answered she looked at him searchingly as he approached her why i don't believe that you have slept at all she cried i didn't feel very sleepy he replied evasively you sat up all night on guard she explained you know you did the chinks might have been shadowing us it wasn't safe to sleep he admitted but i'll tear off a few this morning after we find a feed of some kind what can we find to eat here this crick is full of fish he explained and if you've got a pin i guess we can rig up a scheme to hook a couple the girl found a pin that he said would answer very nicely and with a shoelace for a line and a big locust as bait the mucker set forth to angle in the little mountain torrent the fish unwary and hungry thus early in the morning proved easy prey and two casts brought forth two splendid specimens i could eat a dozen of them minnows announced the mucker and he cast again and again until in twenty minutes he had a goodly mess of plump shiny trout on the grass beside him with his pocket knife he cleaned and scaled them and then between two rocks he built a fire and passing sticks through the bodies of his catch roasted them all they had neither salt nor pepper nor butter nor any other viand than the fish but it seemed to the girl that never in her life had she tasted so palatable a meal nor had it occurred to her that the odor of the cooking fish filled her nostrils that no food had passed her lips since the second day before no wonder the two ate ravenously enjoying every mouthful of their repast and now said billy byrne i think i'll pound my ear for a few you can keep your lamps peeled for the chinks and the first phony noise you hears why you be sure to wake me up and with that he rolled over upon the grass asleep almost on the instant the girl to while away the time explored their rock-bound haven she found they had but a single means of ingress the narrow pass through which the brook found outlet beyond the entrance she did not venture but through it she saw beneath a wooden slope and twice deer passed quite close to her stopping at the brook to drink it was an ideal spot one whose beauties appealed to her even under the harrowing conditions which had forced her to seek its precarious safety in another land and with companions of her own she could well imagine the joy of a fortnight spent in such a sylvan paradise the thought aroused another how long would the mucker remain a safe companion she seemed to be continually falling from the frying pan into the fire so far she had not been burned but with returning strength and the knowledge of their utter isolation could she expect this brutal thug to place any check upon his natural desires why there were few men of her own station in life with whom she would have felt safe to spend a fortnight alone upon a savage uncivilized island she glanced at the man where he lay stretched in deep slumber what a huge fellow he was how helpless would she be were he to turn against her yet his very size yes and the brutality she feared were her only salvation against every other danger than he himself the man was physically a natural protector 
for he was able to cope with odds and dangers to which an ordinary man would long have since succumbed. She had found that she was both safer and less safe because the mucker was her companion. As she pondered the question, her eyes roved toward the slope beyond the opening into the amphitheater. With a start, she came to her feet, shading her eyes with her hand, and peering intently at something that she could have sworn moved among the trees so far below. No, she could not be mistaken. It was the figure of a man. Swiftly, she ran to Byrne, shaking him roughly by the shoulder. Someone is coming, she cried, in response to his sleepy query. End of chapter 13